<clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. If you could use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. while we let a few more people log in before we get started. I'm in Seattle. Alyssa is in London. Naomi's in Seattle. Hello. London, Minneapolis, Ballard, Wisconsin. I love this. Washington, DC. Oh, I hope that everything is okay where you are. Vermont, hello. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started and just let others join us. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle, Washington called Book Larder. And we have a kitchen in our shop where we would typically hold lots of author talks and cooking classes. And so in the current situation, we have taken those events to Zoom. So thank you for being here with us. One of the really wonderful things about this is that it has given us the opportunity to welcome authors and guests from all over the world. And so, um, so we'll see the upside of that as well. I'm glad you're here for this conversation. We are so delighted to welcome Alyssa Timoshkina. She is the author of this amazing book, Salt and Time, that is all about um, the food of Russia and Siberia in particular. And she is also the creator of the Mother Food podcast, which you may also um, be a fan of as well. She's going to be in conversation with Seattle-based writer, Naomi Tomke, who has her own book, the Pacific Northwest Seafood Book. And um, they are going to chat about the book, about um, some sort of Russian holiday traditions, and they will, of course, leave time for you to ask questions. So if you could please just use the Q&A button on your screen to ask any questions, um, that will make it easier for, for Naomi to track those. The book is, of course, also available on the Book Larder website, and um, you can support this uh, author talk and others that we do and just support our shop by choosing to purchase it from us if you are so inclined and I know many of you already own it and that's wonderful so thank you for that too. Um, I also did just want to acknowledge you know Alyssa is uh, tuning in from pretty serious lockdown in London where um, COVID is unfortunately spreading very rapidly. Naomi and I are both in sort of a modified stage of lockdown and of course living in a country that is going through some pretty serious stuff right now. So I hope that um, we can all sort of see this as a time to take care of ourselves and use our brains in different ways. And um, I know that I personally get a lot of comfort from cooking at times like this when it's sort of one of those things I can at least control a little bit. Um, so thank you very much for being here today and I hope that this is helpful for you. So I am going to now welcome Alyssa and Naomi. Hi. 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 Well, thank you so much, Lara. And um, it's great to meet you, Alyssa. Thanks for joining us. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. I've met Lara last year. Actually, she was in London. So we had the pleasure of having breakfast together at my house. Uh, when we recorded an episode for her oh, podcast. Man. So it's been lovely to reconnect and share this hour together. Wonderful. It's lovely uh, to meet you. So it has been kind of a wild holiday season. Um, and I know today is kind of a, a special day for Russians. Um, and I want to get to that in one second. But I actually want to back up first and talk about New Year's traditions because I loved reading about the tradition of salads um, for Russian New Year. Can you tell me a little bit about what that is and 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 why? Yeah, absolutely. So um, today is um, Orthodox Christmas Day, and I thought it's really uh, wonderful that we chose this date um, to host our talk. 
but in Russia, um, a Christmas has a very complicated history, um, which is very much intertwined with the history of the Soviet Union. So for most parts of the 20th century, when the Soviet state was in power, um, Christmas as any other religious celebrations um, was banned, but people still needed, needed that kind of one holiday a year that had this kind of sacred quality. And so by uh, partly by um, the decree of the state, but also kind of just naturally, because um, you know Christmas and New Year, they're so close together. Um, the New Year's Eve became that one special holiday of the year. And most people, well, I'm not gonna say all people because it's such a huge <laughs> statement, but I think it's pretty safe to say that almost all people um, across the whole of the former Soviet Union. So from kind of the Caucasus and Belarus to all the way to the Far East um, through Kazakhstan and you know, to the rest of the Central Asia, they would celebrate the New Year's Eve. And um, there's a very specific uh, set of um, what we would call salads, but they're so rich and heavy, <laughs> kind of proper winter meals really, um, that everyone would have. So it's the Russian salad known as the Olivier salad, and also uh, a very kind of peculiarly cold dish of herring and furs or herring in a fur coat, which is um, root, layers of root vegetables um, with um, herring, fillet, and it's all drowned in mayo, um, and lots of other different dishes. Again, mostly root, boiled root vegetables, some kind of a protein and mayo, the classic kind of Soviet ingredient. Um, and that would be really something that people looked forward to kind of from as early as the summer, partly because of the food shortages. So for example, the most uh, popular and kind of uh, widespread Russian salad that is made pretty much across the globe, um, people would start shopping for it in the summer because you know if you see a can of tinned peas, um, which was a big rarity, you would snatch one as soon as you can and then kind of keep it safe until the big event. Um, same with mayo. My family comes from Siberia, um, so the stuff that you get in the shops uh, would be very different to what you can get in Moscow or other big cities. So in Moscow, of course, people had a slightly different relationship to food, um, even though it was still sparse and you still had to queue, but in provincial places it was even more so. So the most simple Olivier salad, which again is just root vegetables, a bit of pickles, uh, pickled um, gherkins and mayo was such a delicacy because you had to kind of hunt for it and save up ingredients for it. So that taste and that very kind of ritual of actually pre preparing it and opening that uh, can, uh, not the can, the um, jar of mayo and it was just so special and just the flavor. I mean, we these days you can buy mayo everywhere and it's, you know, <laughs> There's like a hundred brands of mayo in Russia, but still that flavor and that's just what it symbolizes just has such a special place in everyone's hearts. And um, here, like I've lived in the UK for 21 years now, um, but it wouldn't be New Year's without uh, the Russian Olivia salad. And also there's a really lovely film that everyone watches. It's set, uh, the, you know, the story in the film is set on the New Year's Eve and they eat the Olivia salad there. So it's like, <laughs> it's a very wonderful immersive experience that everyone watches it and you know, you know it all by heart, but you still love it. In such a like dark and cold time of year, like it's just, it's great to have a ritual to look forward to, I think. And you know, whether that is salads and a film or, or however you celebrate the holiday, whatever it is that you've done yeah. for so long, it, it becomes that sort of light in the, in the darkest yeah. time of the year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this year in particular, I mean, it's been a very difficult year for most of us. And um, for my family, we had a fire in our building just three days before the New Year's Eve. Um, it was the neighbor downstairs who caused it. So me and my family were forced out of our flat. <laughs> Luckily, we had some friends to um, host us who were away. Um, and we we're all kind of distressed and tired. But on the 31st, I was like, no, 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 I have to make the Olivier salad. We have to put that film on because otherwise it's just not going to be right. And as soon as I started cooking, I just kind of felt 
grounded and okay again and it was such a beautiful reminder that just how powerful that ritual is it, yeah. yeah it was incredible yeah and not not too hard of a thing to make in a new kitchen so <laughs> yes <laughs> um let's move on to today um you you mentioned orthodox christmas a little bit talking about new year's what um what is it what is the significance and, and how do you celebrate so the Orthodox Christmas is celebrated um, not just in Russia, but um, in the um, Christian um, Baltic states, so the Baltic countries, um, Ethiopia, Armenia, Georgia. Um, and it's essentially very similar to the European Christmas that we all know and celebrate. Um, just the date is different depending on the calendar that was used to celebrate it. Um, so basically the traditions are very similar. There's the, um, it kind of depends on how um, religious you want to be or you are by your upbringing. Um, you know, here obviously in the, in the West or like in the UK, it's a very kind of commercialized family holiday. So you don't really have that much religious kind of symbolism or religious practices attached to it. Whereas in Russia, it would be a little bit more kind of religion focused. Uh, there would be always a fast before um, the Christmas Eve. So before the 6th of December, um, you would have quite a strict fast, which is kind of a vegan um, diet. And then as soon as the sun sets and there's a first star that appears in the sky, you can start feasting um, and go to church. So I remember, I think I was around seven when we started celebrating again and when people were allowed to go back to the church and we did yeah I, we even did like a whole overnight um church service i was quite young and remember it really well just kind of the excitement of being allowed to stay up <laughs> so late but also kind of the beauty of the religious ceremony and then the food itself um again very simple there wouldn't be anything particularly specific that my family I would make, um, but the one kind of classic thing would be a roast duck or a goose with a stewed sauerkraut. So you would uh, kind of make a stewed sauerkraut first and then you would stuff. If it's a big goose, then you would stuff it. Or if it's just kind of a small duck, you would place the duck on top of the sauerkraut and then all the fat um, seeps into it. Um, so that, that's kind of a classic Christmas meal that is a must in um, my family. Sounds lovely. Um, you mentioned a lot about sort of the remembering the traditions from your childhood. And um, I'm really curious, you have a, a young daughter and how do you bring the traditions of, of um, Russia and, and of your upbringing to your kid? And how do you think about that? And or do you consciously try to make sure she understands what these all meant to you or or do you just feel like she'll she'll get it from from eating it all the time yeah. it's a great question and it's something that i'm constantly revisiting and, and asking myself um and i've recently realized it's um it's been a very curious kind of coincidence in my life that when i um got my cookbook deal and started working on it on the book um i became pregnant as well and it was that particular year, that kind of nine months, that the most intense work was happening. I traveled to Russia twice. I did lots of cooking, um, you know, recipe testing and cooking with my mom. Um, so it was a really beautiful kind of immersion into my, um, into the food of my childhood, into the recipes of my great grandmother, you know, kind of revisiting all the um, recipes that are so special to me that were cooked by all these women in my family. And I've realized that by doing that, I was already introducing my daughter <laughs> before she was born to all those flavors, because obviously what we eat when we're pregnant, um, the fetus can already absorb through the amniotic fluid and you know their taste buds develop quite early on. So I was like, oh my goodness, she was already <laughs> kind of familiar with Russian food even kind of before I consciously started thinking about it. Um, and then when she was old enough to eat um, solid food, yeah, I, I started thinking of what 
um, you know, from what I cook usually, what are the things that I can introduce to her? So things like cottage cheese, uh, twarog, uh, you make like really lovely uh, kind of breakfast fritters with it, which she really likes. And then today we just had some borscht <laughs> and she really liked it as well. Uh, she loves sauerkraut, which I was very surprised and pleasantly surprised to discover. Um, I haven't obviously given it to her when she was little because of the salt, but recently um, I started introducing a little bit and she just loves it. So yeah, she seems quite, well, kind of familiar or open to the, those flavors. Um, certainly a lot more open than my um, English South African partner. <laughs> um, you mentioned um, going back uh to, to the foods of your, your grandmother. Um, and I, I wanted you, you to just touch on the role of, of women in, the, mm. in Russian cooking and Russian traditions. And if you find that there's big differences between how, it, how the role of cook and um, traditional foods for women um, is different in the UK versus Russia. Yeah, it's such a fascinating question. And um, there's definitely a cookbook in there what I'm exploring at the moment. Um, in, in Russia, um, it's kind of complicated. On the one hand, um, there's a really strong tradition of women, I guess, in the same way as in Italy, you have the kind of the cooking or the food of the nonna. Um, in Russia, the same kind of the grandmother is such a big figure, culturally speaking partly because of um, the generational gaps used to be a lot smaller, uh, shorter. Um, so most children would grow up with their grandparents and the age difference would be like 40 years or 45 years or something, you know, so it's not that big a gap. Um, and the food that you first kind of encounter is most often cooked by your grannies because women, you know, had children young, but they would have to go back to education or work. Um, so there's a really beautiful, strong figure of the woman. Um, but at the same time, of course, um, Russia, kind of Russian culture mentality is still quite sexist. So it often feels like women definitely are kind of, you know, they're strong characters in their kitchens, but it's almost because they have no other choice. Um, whereas here in the UK, I found that um, women definitely have a lot more freedom socially speaking, um, but that kind of comes at perhaps at a cost of not being as connected to that really beautiful relationship to food and the ability to feed and just the love of cooking. Um, again, I speak from a personal experience and I can't speak for kind of from you know, the whole of England, but it just, from my experience, the women that I've met here and back in Russia, um, there's definitely kind of a more more excitement around food in general in Russia, even if it's very simple food, but everyone just loves cooking and they have the, you know, recipes that they always talk about. So, you know, food really is a kind of a glue, like a cultural glue and social glue that people kind of stick together with. And it's a big kind of conversation point. Whereas here, I, you know, I've, I've never had the really kind of engaging, passionate <laughs> conversation about food, unless you are with the, you know, professional media where you're talking to fellow food writers and chefs. Right. If you talk to me anywhere, <laughs> it's, there's going to be passion about food. <laughs> um, now, you've mostly talked about Russian food, but one of the things that I found most fascinating about the book um, was the Siberian traditions and the point of view, not from a Moscow um, based outlook. Um, I think if you ask most people in the Western world what they know about Siberia, they're gonna say that it's cold and far away. <laughs> yeah. um, but can you tell us a little bit more about um, how the environment, geography and culture shaped the food? Um, yeah, the Siberia. definitely. And I think to me there was, I mean, I kind of knew it on some level, but I didn't realize the extent to which um, kind of the general understanding of Siberia is very one dimensional, as you've just rightly said. Um, and there is a lot more of um, Asian influences. And, you know, if you kind of think about Russia and Russian food, um, it kind of is automatically grouped with Eastern European cuisine. 
which is true up to a point because Russia for most parts is actually territorially is in Asia. And especially where I come from, it's a city called Omsk, which is um, on the border with Kazakhstan. So it's kind of, you know, if you look at the map, it's kind of at the lower part of central Siberia. Um, you know, you're kind of not so far away from Iran and um, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, um, India, so, you know, China, Mongolia. So there's all these incredible influences that have been there for centuries, which through very kind of dynamic history of migration and um, conflict as well, of course, um, food has permeated the borders. And um, there is also a lot of interesting indigenous food, which um, is becoming a lot harder to kind of find because, you know, sadly the indigenous people, they don't really have that much autonomy and freedom to kind of be themselves or be part of the kind of mainstream culture. Um, but there are still a few recipes that um, I have included in the book, which have uh, become kind of popular mainstream stuff. So yeah, Siberian cuisine is interesting in a way that, um, you know, on the one hand, and I guess that's just the phenomenon of kind of post-Soviet culture, that the sense of uniformity, like this, you know, the, the dishes that we have on the New Year's Eve, it's crazy to think that from, you know, such a huge part of the world, from you know, the far, far east to Ukraine, people eat the same stuff. But at the same time, regional cuisine is so vibrant and um, <clears throat> the kind of the, the historical borders have influenced um, so much of how um, different food is and how actually, how Asian Siberian food is, as opposed yeah. to you know, Eastern European. Yeah, and I mean, I can't remember I think it was actually not in the book, but maybe in an article that I was reading that was, that you had um, spoken to. But one of the things about the about Siberia was that it was um, it was a place that people were kind of sent to from other yeah. places. Um, yeah. And I actually, if we have tons of extra time to fill, I can tell the story. My own great grandfather, um, my family ended up coming to America because of pieces of Siberia. So um, it's a incredible. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, but I, I think that it, it, it's interesting that, yeah, it was this place that was considered so cold and far away, but it was also where all of these different cultures were meeting. Yeah. People were sent there from so many, so many different parts. Mm. Yeah. Um, it is also cold. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> uh, and one of the things that I love the most and one of the recipes that I cannot wait to make was the frozen fish sashimi. Yeah. Um, I just thought that was fascinating and I and obviously I haven't made it yet, but imagining the, the textures and the flavors there, um, it sounded kind of like um, an oyster shooter granita made with fish or something. And I, I, I'm excited to try it. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> but as we face down this winter, um, as we've been discussing, um, Siberian food culture also obviously has a lot of knowledge about how we deal with the cold through food. Yeah. Um, so tell me what you know about uh, what you know and what you think about how we how we stay warm and fight off the the dreariness of winter through food. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's one of those kind of jokes that I keep hearing you know whenever I say I'm cold here they're like oh my goodness but you're from Siberia you know you're in London surely you can't be cold but like seriously the, the key is to dress well <laughs> and I'm still um, sometimes amazed by how there's such a kind of contrast of how people dress to and you know what the weather is doing um, so there's a real sense of like knowing how to add layers and um, you know natural material you know there's lots of um, wool and nice warm socks so that's definitely a first that every Siberian knows um, but also yeah food is such a big part of um, kind of keeping warm uh, socially speaking as well um, and the knowledge of this idea of food as medicine is particularly strong in Siberia. I mean, that's probably something that is one of the good things that is known about the region that, you know, the Siberian shamans and, you know, there's a real tradition of herbalism. 
and um, yes, just kind of the understanding of the healing properties of food. Um, so I think like in my family, as well as pretty much in most Siberian families um, or Russian families in general, um, the key thing would probably be the ferments. And that's why, you know, it says plays such a big part in my um, kind of culinary identity and my palate, I guess, because it's a very particular um, flavor and texture and scent that you kind of are born into it. <laughs> And it's, you know, for some people, it's still quite hard to um, get used to it. Um, so fermented food, um, things like sauerkraut, uh, fermented tomatoes and cucumbers were the most common things. I mean, these days, um, you know, fermentation is such a trend. Like you've got Noma that ferments like everything under the sun in the most scientific, complex ways. I mean, my kind of fermentation is literally a few vegetables um, and maybe like obviously you know kvass the drink um, and that's it pretty much <laughs> but um, at the same time it kind of has all the incredible um, nutrient quality and the most incre incredible uh, flavor qualities um, obviously back in the soviet days um, there was not much food um, import export going on so um, you couldn't really get much of fresh produce um, that wasn't seasonal in winter, so preserving your um, glut from the kind of early autumn was the only way to really get vegetables in winter. And you get all this extra benefit of the friendly bacteria that develops in the ferment um, while it's um, getting itself ready for winter. So um, the interesting thing is that I've learned all of that only recently when this, you know, this whole kind of science and arts of fermentation became so popular. But in Russia, you just did it because um, you knew that there's a lot of vitamin C, for example, in the sauerkraut, which is so essential for your immune system during the cold months. Um, but mostly it's just a way of adding vegetables to your diet um, and also just adding flavor um, because Russian cuisine is not that rich in terms of spices. I mean, there's kind of a key five or so um, spices that you use in cooking. So adding sauerkraut to your uh, like soups or stews um, is just such an incredible way to add complexity and depth of flavor. So I think to me, this is really one of the first things that I really long for is like a really hearty, um, soup, almost more like a stew with grains, um, like pearl barley, um, mushrooms and sauerkraut. That's the kind of thing that I really love and cook all the, all, all kind of every winter all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sounds lovely and hearty. Like it will yeah. get through. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that there's just sort of a, a few, few key spices. So are there ingredients that you really love from Siberian or Russian cooking that you found hard to get in the UK or has it been pretty easy or are there things that you really miss? I think until recently in terms of spices, I mean, Russian food is really wonderfully simple in that way. Um, I was a few years ago, I was doing a supper club, like a pop-up thing for a month where each week I cooked uh, food from different regions of the former Soviet Union. And I had my um, spice box with me. And then, you know, when I was doing the Caucasus, you know, it was a huge amount of spices, Central Asia, you know, just to make one soup, you need like 10 different spices. And then there was Russia and there was like salt and pepper. <laughs> and that was it. And, you know, it was, it was still wonderful. So yeah, in terms of spices, I mean, there's coriander is a big flavor. Um, whether, you know, powdered coriander or uh, coriander seeds, um, fennel seeds, caraway seeds, and salt and pepper, that's, that's it really, um, and bay leaves. But, uh, so in that sense, it's quite easy to um, replicate the flavors. Um, but the thing that I do, I did miss a lot uh, was a good rye bread. That's quite a big, part of uh, culinary culture and the flavor itself, that kind of dark molassy um, rye and good um, soured cream as well. Um, 
I'm, I'm talking, you know, when I came to the UK 20 years ago, the food landscape was very different. Yeah. Hopefully it's not going to change again <laughs> now that we're not part of the EU. Um, but, you know, these days you can get the most incredible um, sour creams and there's lots of really lovely rye breads and, you know, ba baking in general has really kind of stepped up in the last 10 years or so. Yeah. So now I feel like I can deliver a really wonderful Russian meal without lacking any, any flavors or ingredients. That's good. Um, the last time I hosted one of these talks, we were talking to Caroline um, Eden about, oh, amazing. Um, about her book, Red Sands. And, and we got into a whole discussion of, of Smetana and Russian style sour cream. So um, thankfully they're, they're available here in Seattle too. So um, yeah. One of the questions that I always love to ask, we talked a little bit about ingredients that were missing, but is there, are there any cooking tools that you, um, or like uh, specific kinds of pans or tools that you like to have um, on hand to make Russian food that would be different than, than what you'd find in a normal British kitchen? Um, well, I think a cast iron pan to make uh, pancakes and it's something that I've been really um, shying away from, <laughs> even though like I grew up with my granny cooking pancakes on a proper old school, heavy cast iron pan. Um, when I started learning how to cook, I was only using nonstick pan and like old school Russian, you know, grannies would be like, oh my God, what are you doing? Um, so it's only recently that I've you know, felt confident enough to, to start cooking pancakes properly on a cast iron pan. So I think um, that's the one thing that I miss. And I really like see my granny's cast iron pan when I think of that. Um, other than that, you know, there's no um, kind of real sp specific um, equipment or specific kind of utensils that you would need to cook Russian food. I mean, there's a, a clay pots um, which I completely forgotten about. And when I was kind of brainstorming recipes for the cookbook, I remembered that really lovely old school um, dish of a very simple trout and potato stew that you kind of bake in clay pots. Um, and that just brought up memories of, you know, it's just the scent and the, like it, does, it actually does taste very different. And it's that magical moment of opening, taking the lid off and that <gasps> scent comes out that I haven't been able to replicate with anything else. Um, so actually when I went back to Russia for the book shoot, I bought the proper clay pots and I retested the recipe and that, yeah, that moment of taking the lid off is just so beautiful. Clay pot cooking everywhere in the world. It just did there, it gives something else that is not, not quantifiable. Yeah. yeah. To a dish. Um, when you sat down to, to write your book or when you talk about Russian or Siberian food, are there misconceptions that you feel like the Western world has um, about the food or the cuisine or even the culture as it relates to, to eating that you mm. hope to help dispel? Yes. <laughs> I think with my book, there were so many things that I was hoping to, to strip away and to really show again, not claiming to speak for the whole of Russia because, you know, it's huge and it's just a, you know, a fruitless endeavor anyway, but just kind of show my version of the food and the stories that I remember. Um, I guess one of the things, of course, is that it's bad, <laughs> bad food, bland, heavy, stodgy, gray, not pleasant to look at. And I mean, there's a perfectly understandable Kind of ground for these ideas you know many people who traveled to russia did so during the soviet era and most of them ate at canteens which were not known for quality ingredients you know the little that those canteens had you know probably was taken away by the canteen workers to their own houses because they had you know not enough money to feed their families and so what you would get at the canteen was you know very hard to call food um, so it's very understandable why that happened, but, you know, people, you know, if you had the chance of actually going into a family and eating with, um, with a family, then your experience would have been completely different. Um, so I think just that kind of really hoping to move past 
those stereotypes and that kind of hangover of the Cold War that still exists. Um, and also just kind of in terms of specific ingredients, um, cabbage, I absolutely love cooking with cabbage. And um, again, for various reasons, of course, you know, there's cabbage and there's cabbage, but um, there's so many beautiful dishes um, that in, you know, in Russia, cabbage is a big ingredient. Um, and there's so many wonderful dishes and it's such a versatile ingredient from, again, sauerkrauts to like fresh crunchy slaws to stews or using it as a casing for a pie or like a, you know, cabbage rolls. I mean, it's just the most incredible ingredient. So I really, it really has been my kind of personal mission to reclaim <laughs> cabbage and actually show that it's a really beautiful thing. I also love cabbage. So I'm totally on team. Let's re let's get cabbage back. Let's make cabbage cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, one of the things that I found really um, lovely about the book and that I think you did phenomenally well was bringing a very modern um, outlook and aesthetic and um, feel to the book. It didn't feel like, you know, you talked about sort of this backwards looking idea of the Cold War era Soviet yeah. food and, and without having to kind of get too far from the idea of the food, you wove in that very modern feel. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you thought through how, how you would do that or, or what, what sort of process went into turning these dishes into something so, so yeah. modern and updated? Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. It really is lovely to hear that because I, yeah, I've put in a lot of kind of creative energy into that. Um, well, partly in just in terms of the dishes themselves, um, it was in a way it was quite an organic process. It's kind of how I cook myself. And I, I was vegetarian for quite a long time. So I have kind of updated a lot of recipes for myself just because I didn't eat meat at the time. And that kind of, actually I felt that it often really lightened up the flavor, you know, cause if the, especially if there's also anything else which is quite rich like sour cream or butter, you know, just actually making a vegetarian really lift it up. And also just um, living and cooking and then professionally cooking in, in London, it's such an amazing place of inspiration. It's such a beautiful multicultural, um, capital and um, yeah I've had the pleasure and the luck of working with such a fantastic array of chefs and cooks that again I just kind of naturally absorbed some influences and I was like oh what if I you know I used to work in a for example with a Persian chef a really lovely friend of mine she had a cafe and a market uh, stall so I would often help her out and I picked up so many wonderful ideas and thinking that actually there's so much more similarity between Russian and Persian cooking that I previously realized, like the use of dill, for example, or um, just borrowing some of the presentation ideas, you know, the, it might be, a, um, you know, the ingredients might be very classic and kind of authentic, but the way I would present them would be slightly different. Mm -hmm. And then also in terms of um, the overall look, just the styling um, and the kind of aesthetic of the book, um, I had, um, as my background before I was working in food um, is film and kind of a visual culture. I guess, you know, I had quite a strong vision of how I wanted the book to be. And I obsessively collect cookbooks and um, for a huge part because of the aesthetic value. So I just love looking, just kind of purely absorbing it on a visual level. So I had a very kind of precise um, idea of how I wanted the book to look with storyboards and lots of kind of collages that I've put together. But then also had an amazing team of uh, photographer and stylists who actually, and I love it that the book really came alive on the shoot, especially when we were in Russia. And um, I brought, we both brought you know, huge suitcases full of props with us. And then we'd be shooting and then, you know, my photographer would look and then see like my granny's old China. She's like, oh, what about if we introduce that? And then, our natural environment and like the food, I mean, the um, cutlery and the plates that I used, um, you know, when I was a kid, they kind of gradually found their way into the pictures. 
and I just love that because it's so me. So, you know, the one picture of a plate that's made by some artist in Hackney in London and the next one is like my mom's and dad's wedding china. So it's like, it just has such a real, I feel like such a real um, quality to it, which is just, you know, quite authentic um, kind of to my taste and kind of my natural kind of aesthetic environment. So you totally just answered my next question and, and it's entirely, um, <laughs> The, you mentioned, I think in the introduction about in, the idea of indulging the eye um, and, and I, I really got there. Are there specific books or movies, um, you mentioned your background in film, that you kind of kept in mind that you wanted to imitate for the process? Well, I, I mean, I absolutely love um, a Russian film director, Andrei Tarkovsky. And when I was back in my film studies, um, years. Um, I did an MA um, specifically, um, you know, focusing on his work and I even considered doing a PhD, um, but I ended up doing a PhD in another field, I mean, in another film topic. Um, so Tarkovsky's work has always been a huge influence. And then um, with my photographer, um, I, I don't think she knew of him before. So I said, please watch, you know, if you want to watch one film, watch Tarkovsky's Mirror. Um, just you know not that I necessarily wanted to replicate anything but it's just there's something about his aesthetic you know he's very Russian in a way like in a sense that he's very much passionate about exploring and depicting Russian landscape Russian culture through, you know poetry and so on um, but also has a very kind of refined unique aesthetic about it um and then yeah so we both watched kind of rewatched mirror and when we're in russia just the landscapes and some of the setups were kind of tarkovskian and again not in the sense that we deliberately replicated anything so i've had a few people since then saying oh i've never like realized that a cookbook could be like a tarkovsky movie and to me this is like <laughs> the biggest compliment <laughs> Yeah, you, you got it. You nailed it then. <laughs> um, what was the hardest part of writing the cookbook? What was the biggest challenge in doing it? Mm. I think probably um, it was a very kind of natural, easeful process. Like I'm, I'm trying to write the second cookbook now and it's, it's a lot more difficult. Um, so I'm just thinking back thinking, wow, that, that first book just kind of flew out of me. It's incredible. Um, but I think the hardest part was precisely because it was so easy and um, it just kind of made perfect sense to me in my head, then getting back my editor's feedback and trying to tweak it to, um, you know, non-Russian audience. And I kind of feel like I've had to lose a lot of kind of in jokes that maybe I felt uh, were more kind of on like, I don't know, obviously kind of portrayed more of me and maybe the Russian reader would have understood. But then, of course, yeah. you know, it is a book for an international audience and um, or, you know, it's just communicates in your own kind of personal stories. You know, they don't always translate. So I think there were a few moments where I felt like, oh, that's a shame. I have to rephrase it or remove certain references. Um, so yeah, I think that that was probably the most challenging part. But overall, yeah, it's been the most joyful and easeful creative process I've ever had. Well, you start, sort of started to get a, an answer to my favorite question to ask cookbook authors, which is, was there any recipe that you wanted to include, but couldn't for whatever reason, whether you couldn't give people the info to succeed or you couldn't uh, an editor nixed it. Is there any recipe that you just really wish you could have feed everyone in the world? <laughs> well, actually, I've, I'm glad that I've managed to push, <laughs> push it through. And it's the, um, the fern, fiddlehead fern oh, yeah. stir fry. Because at first I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And especially because I actually did not have um, any sources to point people to. And fiddle had, I mean, I wasn't able to find it myself in the UK and I've only, um, you know, did the recipe and tested it back in Russia. Um, so that's been a bit of a battle and I really kind of had to convince them to um, include it because it's just such a 
well, A, to, to me, it's a very special recipe that really um, symbolizes my childhood and that kind of marriage of East and West, um, but also just so quirky and unique that I thought, you know, out of 100, there's one that people might read and think, wow, this is weird and never be able to cook it. It's okay, but <laughs> I just had to stand my ground. I have great news on that front for you and for our, our other Seattle people, which is fiddlehead ferns are, are abundant here in the spring. People no can go out and forage them in the foothills around Seattle. And, and we do sometimes see them at farmer's markets and, and high-end grocery stores. So That's brilliant. We can cook it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, and um, then on the other side of thing, that's the most challenging part. What was the best part? Was there a moment when it came into the world or when you first held it in your hands that, that meant so much to you? Oh, yeah, I guess seeing the layout for the first time. And I think, cause you kind of, well, seeing the pictures when we, I know as we were shooting, um, my photographer would create like a collage at the end of each day, just putting all the images together to get a bit of a sense and just realizing how it's actually so much better than I had imagined in my head. But then obviously seeing the actual printed proof um, with the designer's input. And again, I was so lucky to have this most amazing um, designer, Charlotte Heal. Um, and it's like her, the way she's put everything together is just then the book really came alive. And yeah, I think just holding that first kind of big A1 uh, prints in my hands, that was, yeah, that was really special. It is, it's truly, it, it's so um, beautiful and so specific in its style that I think in a, in a way that not every cookbook is, I think that cookbooks are moving more towards that, but you know, it really, it feels like what you would expect to see from something with those influences of modern London and also traditional Siberian. It really, it, um, it telegraphs that well to the reader in the style and in the, and the photos themselves. Um, I think we'll move to some questions from people and, and we're gonna start the question and answer with the lightning round on borscht. <laughs> Are, this is from Olga. Are you team mayo or sour cream? Oh, sour cream. But <laughs> I've, I have to say I've been really anti mayo for a very long time. So I'll be passionately against it. And then recently, obviously, again, there's so many different mayos. Um, a good quality mayo is just divine. And I've maybe four or well, three years ago, I've completely changed my mind. So now I would be kind of almost 50-50, still maybe a little bit more on the side of sour cream, but mayo also is amazing. Meat or vegetarian? Vegetarian, I think. I, I figured after you mentioned the vegetarian that uh, <laughs> they probably had developed a pretty good uh, vegetarian version. Um, hot or cold? Ooh. Oh, that's a tough one. Can I choose both? <laughs> Depending on the season, <laughs> obviously. Cold in the summer and hot in winter. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it's not. It's not a test. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then a great question here from Samantha. Um, for someone who is obsessed with food and interested in traveling to Siberia, what general advice would you give? Um, anything from when is a good time to visit to a couple of must-try dishes. Hmm. Um. Well, I think if you can find a way to um, stay with the family, so, you know, go into a home and be with um, the people, it's the best thing. Like they might not speak English very well or not at all, but Russians love hosting and they're such generous and warm people. Um, despite the kind of, yeah, again, it's a bit of a paradox that, you know, when you walk on the street, people don't really smile much and they don't you know hold the door for you as he, you know people do him here in the UK but if you go to someone's home you get like this completely different dimension that opens up so if there is a way that you can um, find uh, you know someone to host you or even just to go 
visit someone for dinner, I would definitely um, recommend that. Um, and then um, Pilmeni is such a great um, Siberian speciality and uh, homemade Pilmeni is a wonderful thing to share with a group of uh, people. So yeah, I would highly recommend that. Lovely. And in terms of when, when to go, I mean, if you want to experience the real deal and go in winter, <laughs> Yeah, sometime around the New Year, so you kind of get part of the festive um, vibe as well. And um, we went last year, last Christmas, uh, with my family, and I took my little girl for the first time. And yeah, just the beauty of the landscape just never ceases to take my breath away, even though it's so cold, it's crazy. But <laughs> again, if you wrap up warm and you have a nice, good you know, big bowl of pilimeni dumplings waiting for you when you come back from the cold. It's just wonderful. Um, this is from Anna. Do you ever go out to eat Russian or Soviet food or do you only eat it at home? And if you do go out, is it hard for you not to compare someone else's version of Russian food to what you grew up with? Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's hard not to, but um, sometimes... I mean, I haven't done it for a while and obviously not, um, you know, the year just gone. Um, I haven't been out to a Russian restaurant, but um, there's one, one decent one. Um, well, there are actually a few that I've been to um, and it's also just the atmosphere. And um, sometimes it's quite nice to just immerse yourself. You know, it's always slightly over the top Russian, you know, in terms of the decor and the music. Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of this, hyper Russian nostalgia that is played out in those restaurants, which is quite fun to indulge in <laughs> every now and again. Um, and the food is like, yeah, the, the restaurant in, um, in London, Marivana, which I believe is also there's one in LA or somewhere in the States. Um, it's great. The food there is very, I mean, it's so expensive. It's ridiculous to get, you know, and it's very simple home food for that kind of price. It's a bit crazy, but you know, it's the whole experience. And you know, if you do it once in a blue moon, it's perfectly, perfectly, you know, justifiable. So yeah, if 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 oh I can see someone saying it's in Washington. Yeah, treat yourself to a, a trip there, which is quite quite a fun experience. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that is it for questions. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanna let people know about about your book? or about Russian cooking that we kind of didn't get to? Mm. No, I think we've covered everything. Yeah, the questions were amazing, thank you. Awesome, well, thank you so much. I think Lara will, will come back yes, in. Yes, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And thank you so much everyone for tuning in today. Um, I forgot to mention, Alyssa did though, that we do actually have a podcast also, um, if you want to keep listening to um, Alyssa talk about her book and Russian cuisine and her life in London and her film degree and those kinds of things. Um, we actually managed to hit a lot of different topics. So um, so you can get even more from our podcast. Um, just search Book Larder on your favorite podcast app. And of course, look at the Mother Food podcast too that Alyssa created and hosts. So you can get copies of Salt and Time. Um, I also forgot to say this is my absolute favorite picture in the book. And when Alyssa is talking about like layering up <laughs> to go out, I think that pretty much captures it. We could all take a lesson, right? Especially this is actually like my dad's quote. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love that. It's another those like one of those improvisations as we're getting ready to go out. And you know, my coat was hanging next to my dad's coat, and then my photographer goes like, "What if you wore this one?" I'm oh like, yeah, no, totally it's crazy, perfect. but let's do it. No, yeah, I absolutely love that. It's like sort of like we're just walking into this book, and it's perfect. Um, and someone also asked if the recording will be posted anywhere. It absolutely will. Besides having a podcast, we also have a YouTube channel. So within about the next forty-eight hours. It'll be up there. And if you were registered for this, you'll get an email with the link um, to it as well. So you can listen again and share it with friends if you would like. Thank you so much, Naomi. And thank you, Alyssa. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you all stay safe and healthy and happy cooking. Thank you so much for being here. Bye everyone. Bye.